Hi, I'm Pastor Dick Stadler, and I'm here again with Ann Carter and with her son, Tim Carter, and we are talking Sunday readings. And this week, we're going to talk about the readings for Epiphany 4, the fourth Sunday in Epiphany or after Epiphany. And we're going to look at an Old Testament lesson in Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to look at a very interesting section of Paul's letter to the Corinthian Christians in chapter 8 verses 1 to 13, and then we're also going to look at our continuing reading through of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. So if we start with the Old Testament lesson, which is in Deuteronomy 18. A reading from Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. The Lord, um, uh, Moses, to save the context, in Deuteronomy, Moses has the people gathered together as they're about to enter the promised land after 40 years of wilderness wandering. And he's giving them his last will and testament, so to speak. And he reviews some history that's recorded elsewhere in the Pentateuch, in the Torah. And then um, he says to them, God is going to raise up a prophet like me. You better listen to him. Okay. And um, a lot of uh, people identify, a lot of Christians identify that prophet as none other than Jesus Christ. And then in this same reading, we have uh, God telling Moses, this is what's going to happen and to tell the people this. And Moses demonstrates that he's a faithful prophet because he gives them exactly the message that God wants them to know that there is going to be a very special prophet uh, coming along. But what's interesting about this is that he also tucks in um, verse 22, which is after some people's reading. So some people may not hear this. And it's too bad because on those uh, verses, verse 22, he says, if a pro how do you tell if a prophet is really for God or not sent by God? And he says, simple. If what he says comes true, then he's from God. If what he says doesn't come true, then he's not from God. And the Jews use that as a standard to test prophets throughout their history and even down to the time of jesus you remember when he says um at caesarea philippi to his disciples who, what are people saying about me and the disciples say well some say you're the prophet so they that tradition had uh, trickled all the way down to the time of jesus uh, others say you're elijah um and then the jesus of course says but who do you say that i am uh, so, so this is a, a fun reading, even though it's very short, uh, but it's, that's the context for it. Can you think of anything else that we should notice about this? Well, I like the last line of verse 22, which says, you shall not be afraid of him. Yeah. He's not for me. That's right. He, you have he, nothing to fear. That's right. Which implies the opposite. If he is from me, you do. Yeah. Yeah, better let's pay attention to him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13... A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. 
Those who think they know something do not, yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all but in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Paul is talking about apparently something that was a real serious issue in the Corinthian church. And it may have been in other Christian churches that were starting out. And that is, some people apparently felt free to eat food that had been offered to an idol and then was made available to outsiders. And so um, other people, Christians, felt, oh no, no, that's meat that's been contaminated by its association with idol temple sacrifices. Therefore, you can't eat it. And Paul will say there is nothing wrong with eating meat because, the first of all, the idol that um, it was offered to uh, is a non-entity, um, and God is the only true God. And so it's just meat. But then he says, what if a brother still believes it's a sin to eat it? And he sees you eating it. And in order to be socially acceptable and not a misfit, he goes along and eats it while he thinks it's a sin. He said, you are doing him damage. And the implication of this whole text and this whole discussion about meat sacrifice to idols is if you love a brother in the faith, even though you may know that it's okay, your knowledge is not as important as your love for this brother. And so don't put him in a situation where the social pressure of everybody who knows that it's okay will intimidate him to going along with it while he's still feeling it is a sin. Instead, take the time that love requires and instruct him. Show him why it's okay and why it's not a sin. That's the way of love. And I think that has big implications for our behavior over against fellow Christians in this century. In, in our environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there's ahead. also, um, in verse 13, he said, if food is a cause for their falling, I will never eat meat. There's a sacrifice that comes along if you are truly a responsible Christian that you don't want anyone else to fail. So you sacrifice your behavior, even though it's okay, you don't do it so that somebody else doesn't stumble and fall. And that's... Right. And, and I think we have lost that sense now. Sacrifice, yeah. We, we think that we can do whatever we want and it doesn't matter what people think of us. We can just do it. And that's selfish. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we're supposed to be different than that if we're Christian. Well, and, and something else that plays into this is that um, if I um, feel that it's okay, um, and, and I, uh, let's take an example. We know there are Christians who believe it's a sin to, to drink even one drop of alcohol. 
Um, and the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible simply says it's a sin to get drunk. But if you have that person over to your house for supper, and there's a whole bunch of people sitting around the table who feel very comfortable sipping on a glass of wine, and you pour them a glass of wine, and you know that he feels that it's a sin to drink, uh, you may bulldoze that person socially into going against his conscience. And the conscience is not the thing in us that determines what's right and wrong. That's the word. And our thoughts either accuse us or excuse us. The conscience is a smoke alarm. It goes, bring. there's something here that the law of God speaks about. And if a person's conscience is callous, then he's like the person who takes the battery out of the smoke alarm because you're sick and tired of it going off every time you take a hot shower and the steam sets it off. Okay. Um, you may be in big, big peril because your conscience won't ring when it's supposed to and get you to start thinking about what you're doing and comparing it to the word of God. And so real love says, take the time to instruct them. And you have to know that that individual feels that something is a sin that really isn't a sin. So you can't just imagine people out there and then cut yourself off from things that are okay for you to do. Uh, but some people um, are misguided and, and they're weak. And that doesn't mean you just bulldoze them. Uh, it means love them, uh, explain to them why you know from scripture that this is okay and this is not a sin. And like Anne said, this takes time. That means you got to sacrifice time and energy and love and, um, that's what the Lord wants us to do for one another. It requires relationship and yep. relationships take time yep. to get to know somebody, to know what they're afraid of, or to know what they, what they think they can or cannot do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, now if we go on to the gospel lesson in Mark one, we're continuing our reading through of, of Mark. The Holy gospel, according to Mark, they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the other teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Jesus is now, we're told very specifically in Capernaum. Do you have a map uh, that you can pull up? I do. Yes, I okay. do. Let's just help people identify where we are mm -hmm. um, on the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum, here's, oh, there yep, it is. Here's Bethsaida, and then here's Capernaum. It's right on the coast. It's beautiful. And, and, and Capernaum became Jesus' second home after the people in Nazareth tried to throw him over a cliff. <laughs> mm -hmm. He moved into to Capernaum. So this is his, now his adopted new hometown. Mm -hmm. And he immediately, on the Sabbath, he enters the synagogue. And Mark is the gospel writer that uses the word immediately more than any other gospel writer, okay? Uh, some have counted that he has used it 42 times in his gospel, compared to 18 times that Matthew uses the word immediately, seven times that Luke uses it, and six times that John uses it. And so they've asked the question, what's the significance of that? And some have suggested that he's very concerned about just racing along and covering all the different things that Jesus is doing. Um, that another suggestion is this emphasizes his servant identity of Jesus because a servant immediately does what he's expected to do. He doesn't dawdle and he doesn't delay or procrastinate. Um, you'll have to decide for yourself what you see as the significance. And there are two or three other uh, theories out there as to the significance that Mark uses immediately all the way through his gospel. It just, it, in chapter one alone, he uses it 10 times. So uh, that's how it occurs over and over again. So, mm -hmm. 
But here, a man has an evil spirit. And I know some critics of the Bible say, uh, well, this is just an old way of talking about common diseases that we have a different title for. But Mark is very careful to distinguish sicknesses from mm -hmm demon possession. Luke, the physician, does the same thing. Matthew, the gospel writer, does the same thing when Jesus heals people who are demon possessed and those who have various diseases. So I think that that's a kind of a careless reading of the scriptures to simply dismiss this as old-fashioned thinking. I don't know what the phenomenon exactly was, but apparently there are evil spirits and there are good spirits. There are good angels and evil angels. And some of these evil angels take possession of people. And many missionaries can tell you personal uh, experiences that they've had with that phenomenon, even in modern times. So, But uh, Jesus heals him, boom, um, with just his word. He doesn't have to touch him. He doesn't have to do anything. He just heals him. And that's the healing power of Jesus, you know. Any other questions that th this text raises in your mind? Well, uh, um, a question I have that I have throughout a lot of the gospel is Jesus commands the spirit to be silent. Mm, um, and he does this He does this often where, where he does something and he tells his disciples not to tell anybody about it or, or not to reveal his true nature. And I've always been curious, why is that? What is he, what's he got to hide? Or what is he, why does he not want people to tell everybody about him? Because then later he, of course, wants us to, you know, tell everybody. But right. so what is the, what is the significance there? And, and why does he tell this particular spirit to be silent? Well, here's one explanation that a seminary professor gave us. And it had, uh, in my mind, it made a lot of sense. Uh, the job of proclaiming who Jesus is and what he has done for the world is a job that he has given to his church. And he does not want the representatives of the enemy, of Satan, to be doing that job. And so he muzzles them. That's one possibility. Another professor had a different guess, and his was, this is early in his ministry. And he knows that if the opposition to him start hearing that he's being identified as the Messiah, um, the son of man, um, it's going to ramp up the hostility prematurely because he's operating his whole ministry and his whole life on God's timetable. And he's not going to die one second before God ordains it. He's not going to die in the wrong place. Uh, he's going to die on a cross in Jerusalem. And so um, he, it, it, some say that he was just being judicious because he realized the implications if people started to hear that he was being identified as the Messiah. Uh, that has some merit too. Have you heard any other uh, uh, suggestions as to why he muzzled uh, the demons so often? Well, my gut instinct was that he knew that if the word went out, that he, it eventually does, and he can't even go into a city anymore. Mm -hmm. So his work is hindered because he is so popular. People want, want healing from him. They don't necessarily want him uh, to preach to them. They just want him to do something for them. Mm -hmm. So he commands a lot of why he's commanding demons not to talk about him. I think is different than why he doesn't want the word necessarily to go out. Um, <clears throat> that's just what I. Well, what's interesting is that the people in the synagogue do compliment him. They say he speaks with authority, not like the scribes. Mm -hmm. And if my reading of Jewish history is accurate, the rabbis in different periods and those in the Mishnah quote other rabbis and they quote rabbis who have certain prestige as a way of adding authority to their particular teaching. Jesus apparently didn't quote anybody. He just told them what it meant. Mm -hmm. And people notice that, that he's speaking with his own authority, which he did have as God's son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's just an interesting thing to, to look for as we listen to uh, the reaction to him by the scribes and the Pharisees yeah. and their demands for authority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, Tim. No. I thought it was interesting that he, right at the beginning of his ministry, goes into the synagogue and teaches. 
And my limited understanding is that you have to be invited to teach. You also have to have a certain reputation as a teacher to go into a synagogue and teach. So Jesus has been among these people that they would allow him to do this, or else this was his hometown synagogue, and he had been doing this before. That's my, I, again, I, it doesn't tell us. It just gives these tiny little bits of information that we can glean more out of. Well, the Gospels do tell us uh, emphatically that he was 30 years old when he began his ministry. And so, um, uh, and that was the usual age, uh, if what we're learning about Jewish history is true, uh, when a rabbi could begin his career. So um, that may all come together as uh, why um, he's there early in his ministry and he's teaching. Um, but uh, he certainly taught with as one who had authority and people recognize that. And um, can you think of anything else that people need to? Yeah, what did you for? have, Tim? Um, you've answered all of them again. Um, but I'm looking over it again here. Um, and I think it's interesting. This is less of a question and more just kind of a comment that you can can jump off of but the demon says you know uh, what do you want to do with us um have you come to destroy us and jesus doesn't even doesn't even talk to him like he doesn't engage with him the demon is clearly like trying to talk to him and jesus just shuts him down and says no i'm not not dealing with you um which is interesting because it seems to me that in other places he he's not maybe not so abrupt he like with the 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 demons that he lets enter the swine uh, herd you know that that he, he negotiates he negotiates and this time he's just cutting them off no way i'm i'm not having a conversation with you um which is i don't know it just raises kind of an interesting question is you know was he just not not having it today or is there something about this this particular incident that he he was just gonna just i'm not here for this let's get this over with kind of thing i don't know it, was, it just struck me as interesting. Interesting. I think that is interesting. Thanks for raising that because I think what it reveals, one of the things it could reveal is that Jesus is not a cookie, cookie cutter missionary, <laughs> that he has everything the same way all the time and that we have to expect him to do the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, all these different ways of handling demons is a way for us to see the full spectrum of his treatment of them and not to say, oh, in this case, he had to do this and uh, maybe not. Uh, he's son of God, son of man. So uh, he can do what he feels his father wants him to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're thankful that you have watched this conversation. We hope that you learned something new. And if you liked it, please click the like button and subscribe and um, put it on your social media and share it with the world because uh, we'd like to share some of these thoughts with as many people as possible. But we'll see you soon. And in the meantime, may God keep you safe and healthy and close to him. Mm -hmm. Amen.